Listen only mode. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today for this webinar covering the changing landscape of consumer packaged goods. We're going to go ahead and give folks just another minute or so to join, um, so sit tight, we'll get started shortly. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Victor. I'm just going to handle some of the sort of housekeeping items here at the beginning before turning it over to Nikhil, who's going to run through the actual content. Um, so first things first, we will be distributing the slides and uh, recording afterwards, so no need to take notes. Um, any images, etc., that that you see here will be available. Um, if you do have technical difficulty throughout the webinar, you know, Citrix has a pretty decent help desk um, that can help you get online. But again, you'll, you'll get the slides, you'll get the recordings, so um, not to worry. And the, um, the webinar is designed to be a bit interactive, so uh, we'll be taking questions throughout, and you can do that in a couple of different ways. So on Twitter, we're at CB Insights using the hashtag CPG. Uh, also, there's a sort of questions tab within GoToWebinar as well, so feel free to ping us questions throughout the webinar, and we'll collect those and, and save them for Nikhil to try to get to at the end. And then any questions that we don't have time to cover, uh, we'll also sort of do our best to get back to you post-webinar with answers. Um, so with that, let me introduce Nikhil, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Nikhil is a research analyst here at CB Insights. He's obviously done a lot of work in, in consumer products, um, but he's also focused on healthcare and autonomous vehicles. Uh, and we're in good hands. His research has appeared in a lot of publications over the last few years, including some of those listed here, like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, um, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, Nikhil came out of Columbia University uh, prior to CB Insights, and um, so I think, you know, he's definitely an expert. He's definitely geared up and ready to go. And so with that, we'll turn it over to him and uh, sort of enter our data portion of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Victor, and the kind words. Um, today we're going to be talking about consumer packaged goods. We'll dive into some of the trends that are changing the industry, how some of the key players are approaching the space, and things in the near future that could reshape CPG. But first, a little bit about CB Insights. We're a national science foundation-backed company that uses data science and machine learning to help people understand private markets. So whether that's companies they should be selling to, acquiring or investing, trends they should be watching out for, um, people they should be partnering with, or where their competition is moving. And we're used by some of the biggest names in the industry, including Cisco, Salesforce, Castrol, and a whole host of others that you can see on our website. And our mantra is, in God we trust, all others must bring data. We like to make sure that all of our research and analysis are data-driven instead of punditry or anecdotal arguments that you might hear in other parts of the industry. So what are we focusing on today? We're going to take a look at the different industry trends in CPG and how both small and large players are reacting to them. But before we start, it's important to outline exactly what we mean by CPG, just so that we're clear. We define CPG as personal care products, cleaning supplies, pet care products, baby products, beverages, canned and frozen foods, snacks, candies, and dairy products. 
to break down the analysis, we're first going to start with some of the general funding and exit trends happening with companies in private markets. Then we'll take a look at how some of the larger corporates are involved with CPG startups, followed by what some of the trends are that have led to the explosion in small CPG companies. We'll talk a bit about changes in marketing, um, you know, which obviously play a huge role in consumer goods, and how that's changing in part because e-commerce and product distribution is changing, um, which we'll also talk about. The webinar will wrap up by outlining the value of direct-to-consumer products, and then I'll try to answer as many questions as time permits. To break down the analysis, we're first going to start with some of the general funding and exit trends that are happening in, uh, with companies in private markets. So let's start uh, by talking about the CPG in private markets. So I pulled some data from the CB Insights database to take a look at this. Um, as you can see, funding trends to CPG companies have picked up significantly since 2011. More than $3.3 billion in equity financing was invested in 2015 across 400 deals. So that's the second year in a row where deal activity has hit 400. And while there's been a dip in funding in 2016, deals have remained relatively the same. And you can see that when we look at a quarterly view, uh, how there's been relatively stable deal flow since uh, Q1 of 2015. However, funding did drop below 500 million in Q1-16, uh, with very few large deals occurring in the quarter. In the quarters leading up to it, uh, we saw multiple financings of more than $70 million a piece into Dollar Shave Club, uh, Susha Life and The Honest Company, while we only saw a handful of deals above 10 million this quarter. Similar to tech, California saw by far the most deals into private CPG companies with more than 350 deals since 2011. And that was more than the next three states combined. And only five states saw more than 50 deals into CPG and all of them were some of the more common major markets. The top investors in the private CPG companies are a mix of VCs, private equity investors, and food accelerators, which have become a newer and important fixture in the market. One of the accelerators, Excel Foods, topped the list with investments in more than 15 unique CPG companies. Highland Capital Partners was the second most active investor since 2011, with a fund dedicated to consumer-facing growth companies. Out of the most well-funded, still private companies, Agripur Cooperative, Harry's, and The Honest Company round out the top three. Five out of the ten companies on this list are involved in the beverage space, and seven of the ten companies have raised more than $100 million. Exits have gone up considerably since 2011, which saw less than 50 acquisitions, compared to the more than 160 that happened in 2015. 2016 has so far seen a slowdown, but it could easily pick up through the rest of the year. I think what's interesting to note is that uh, most of the companies that are acquired don't raise equity financing prior to acquisition. So even though there's a lot of fanfare that comes with large financings and uh, exits, most of the M&A that happens are actually with much smaller companies that don't necessarily raise beforehand. And driving the M&A trend are the corporates who are scooping up smaller craft brands to expand their offerings and reach new target audiences. The most active acquirer is the recently merged Anheuser-Busch, who bought 15 private companies since 2011. Almost all of them were smaller craft breweries. DS Services of America, a beverage distributor which focuses on water, has acquired nearly 10 different smaller water brands since 2011. And while the majority of acquirers on the list are CPG companies, PBX Capital, which is a holding company, uh, rounded out the bottom of the list. So as we saw, corporates play a major role when it comes to the CPG landscape. And while they're the most active in acquisitions, we'll take a look at some of the other ways that they operate in the space. While corporates are active acquirers, they're actually barely active when it comes to private company investment. And they were actually involved in less than 5% of CPG financings between 2011 and 2014. And even though 2014, 2015, and the first quarter of 2016 have seen an uptick, a part of it is because other types of non-CPG corporates like Google Ventures and Comcast uh, have started investing in the space. I use the CB Insights business social graph to take a look at where some of the biggest CPG corporations are active in private markets. The majority of brand names are involved in the acquisitions of smaller brands, um, like I talked a little bit about before. And of these corporates, 60% of acquisitions happened in the food and beverage space well, nearly a quarter win personal care products. 
And when it comes to equity investments, about 25% of deal share from these corporates went to early stage startups, which we define as seed in Series A. Um, well, mid-stage startups took about 23% of deals, which we define as uh, B and C. And late stage startups, which we call companies that are past Series D, received 17% of deals. Some notable private market financings that I thought were interesting um, sort of showed the different strategies that CBG corporates can take when it comes to um, interacting with private companies. So L'Oreal acquired Colorite into its research division uh, with a company claiming a new scientific patent pending way to improve care coloring and coloring cosmetics. L'Oreal also acquired Urban Decay, which is a cosmetics brand that has a really strong web presence, but also has a foothold in a socially conscious demographic. Um, it's a big part of Urban Decay's brand is not testing its products on animals. Conagra Foods bought a controlling stake in a Chinese potato processing company as it expands more into the area. And they also acquired Blake's, which is a frozen meals company um, that focuses more on the natural and organic meals. And that lets Conagra make more pushes into um, the health conscious demographic, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. Coke has invested in several private companies across the spectrum, including a renewable chemistry company, Avantium, which focuses on creating sustainable products through bio-based materials, a CPG company focused in Nigeria, and also a satellite company focused on providing internet throughout the world, um, which is OneWeb. And so these are just um, a couple different examples that CPG corporates are taking with different strategies when it comes to private companies. So some do it to expand offerings into new demographics, uh, some do it to bolster their R&D, and some do it as moonshot bets. And private markets are starting to become a focus for these corporates as they look towards innovation as a way to bolster sales, um, especially as some of their other products might be slowing down. So Mahmoud Khan, PepsiCo's chief science officer, outlines the benefits that the company has already seen by investing more in innovation. And when we took a look at Pepsi's R&D spend over time, we see that in the last three years, they have actually up, um, up their spend into R&D but it's still a small expenditure compared to marketing and advertising. All other CPG corporates like Unilever have had relatively flat expenditure in internal R&D and a generally wider gap between marketing and R&D. P&G is the largest advertising spender in the world with more than 8 billion year in expenditure compared to 2 billion in internal R&D. And that's, about, that's on about $76 billion in sales. And even though those were some isolated examples with larger players, you can actually benchmark CBG expenditure into R&D compared to other industries. So while consumer isn't the absolute worst, it's still well below other industries that spend 3% and higher of their revenue on research and development, and even as high as 13% in some cases. So while CPG will never dedicate as high of a percentage as, you know, say a tech company, it's still a pretty sharp disparity. Um, and that's especially the case when you look at absolute numbers, where consumer contributes to about 3% in overall dollars spent on research across the board, which is pretty tiny compared to how large the industry is. And all of that is sort of just meant to drive in the point that CPG corporates still have a long way to go in R&D expenditure, but many of them are actually seeing pri smaller private companies as a way to be more innovative. So several corporates have recently announced their uh, recently announced their own corporate venture arms like General Mills, Campbell's, and 7-Eleven. John Hogan, who manages the fund at General Mills, recognizes that some of the smaller brands are able to compete against the advantages that legacy CBG companies have tended to have, and that's thanks a lot to new tools, um, especially in the distribution area, which we'll talk about in a bit. And these corporates aren't just investing in CPG companies, but they're also doing partnerships with different startups. So some of them are doing it as marketing plays, um, like Coke and Spotify. Others are more focused on increasing distribution channels, like the partnership with uh, on-demand alcohol company Drizzly. P&G recently partnered with CPG crowdfunding platform CircleUp um, to find some of the more up-and-coming brands. And sometimes the startups actually create entirely new products, um, like L'Oreal, which I thought was really cool, and partnered with a startup that created a UV sensing patch. On the other hand, it's not always friendly. So sometimes startups, if they're um, competing directly with the larger corporates, can also find themselves in the crosshairs of lawsuits too. 
While other corporates are picking up their activity with CPG startups, Unilever has actually been involved in private markets for a while, so we're just going to do a quick case study on them uh, to analyze them using CB Insights data. Their corporate venture arm has been around since 2002 and has done 20 deals since 2011 alone. Prior to 2012, the company was more focused on hard sciences, chemistry, and healthcare investments, but recently the company has focused more on investing in companies that increase the reach of their products or introduce new streams of data to help the company uh, target and segment uh, customers. So there are companies like Bliss, which focus on location data and uh, make mobile ads better. The parent corporation, Unilever itself, is more focused on acquisitions of products within a focus. Uh, the six acquisitions that the company has made in the last few years have helped expand their product offerings in certain areas, such as the acquisition of Grom and Talenti into the, into the gelato space, um, and they also have made four acquisitions into the skin cream space. So when the company wants to move into an area, acquisitions of private companies are one way that it does that. What's interesting about Unilever is that while the parent company deals with more mature brands and the venture arm invests in growing companies, they've also recently launched Unilever Foundry as they move downstream to help provide resources um, to people that have ideas. Unilever is making it clear that they're interested in smaller companies and they've positioned themselves to be available at every stage of the company life cycle from idea to fully matured. And a big reason for that is because Unilever recognizes that small CPG businesses are on the rise and so they're able to position themselves well as consumer taste changes, um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about right now. Small and medium-sized CPG businesses are growing, and they're taking market share away from large businesses who have seen a slowdown in sales growth. That's resulted in approximately $18 billion in sales shifting from larger to smaller players since 2009, according to BCG. And on top of that, more new products than ever are being created in consumer goods, both in the food and beverage department, but also particularly in the non-food category as well. And craft brands continue to increase, so beer is one area that's seen this trend clearly. Um, there were more than 2,500 registered craft breweries in 2014 compared to less than 500 in 2006. So you may have noticed that there are way more six-pack brands to choose from when you're at the grocery store nowadays. In fact, you may have noticed that there are actually just more choices for your goods in general. The rise of craft products have seen more companies develop and focus on their individual products, which are unbundling large corporate brands by creating direct competitors. We searched through the CB Insights database and found a list of startups that are attacking different products under the larger P&G umbrella, and that list continues to grow every day. So what are some of the factors that are leading to this growth? Aside from general manufacturing and supply chain improvements, um, some more recent developments that are startup specific are the rise of CPG focused accelerators, which give uh, small brands access to mentors, uh, manufacturers, and a network of relationships to get their brands in front of people. And also many CPG brands are turning to crowdfunding platforms like Circle Up or Indiegogo to more easily secure initial financing, but also to gauge consumer demand. Targeted advertising through online mediums let brands find consumers easier, and then they also don't necessarily need the retail networks the same way that they did before. But also, retailers now have a higher propensity to give shelf space to craft goods because many of them appeal to consumers with a higher likelihood to spend more in niche tastes. Deloitte recently put out a customer survey to analyze what people would pay premiums for, and a third of responders would pay a 10% premium for a craft version of a product. People also would pay premiums for convenience, health, and innovation. Sustainability also commands a premium around the world. So between 2011 and 2014, a higher percentage of consumers, um, actually the global majority, said they were able to, they were willing to pay for a premium for products from socially responsible companies. And as I mentioned before, health is becoming a bigger focus for consumers. But it's not just health in the sense of fitness. People also care more about ingredients in their goods. People are willing to pay more for natural products, and they focus on things like the number of preservatives in food and whether it's processed. 
And it's trends like this that push Kraft to change its iconic mac and cheese recipe to include less preservatives and replace them with more natural ingredients. And some startups see opportunities by appealing to specific ethnic demographics. So instead of using a one-size-fits-all approach, some smaller companies focus on the needs of a specific ethnicity and develop great brands around that base. So those are some of the interesting shifts in consumer taste and some of the opportunities that might exist for new CPG brands, which a lot of well-capitalized startups are taking advantage of and retailers are excited to sell. Um, I'm just bringing back the unbundling graphic for a second to point out a few successful startups like Juice Beauty and Fresh Pet, which have banked on the organic trend, Dollar Shave Club, which makes it as convenient as possible to get razors by mailing it to your door, or Walker & Company, which has focused their products for people of color. But one of the companies that I particularly want to focus on and has, has had some significant success is The Honest Company. Um, for those of you that don't know, now, it was started by Jessica Alba and Christopher Gavigan, and it focuses on products that are family safe and made with natural ingredients, things like cleaning products and diapers. And that's taking advantage of one of the trends we talked about earlier that people are willing to pay for, especially new mothers. The company is actually in the midst of a few lawsuits about chemicals in their formula, which are a bit questionable in the eyes of some consumers and organizations. But that really just goes to show you that people are really focused on this and they care, and it's one of Honest Company's main differentiators. Regardless, the company did $170 million in sales in 2014 and sells both direct to consumer through their website, but also through a network of retailers like Target, Costco, and Whole Foods. The company is currently valued at $1.7 billion and is exploring M&A options or an IPO. A big factor to the honest success was how smart and successful their marketing campaigns were as purchasing behavior shifted. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how marketing is changing for CPG companies. Before, marketing was very loosely targeted and strategies were much more dependent on physical store purchases. I took this snippet from a 1994 issue of the Harvard Business Review, which talks about using line extensions as a low cost and low risk way to hit more customer segments and increase their control over limited shelf space. You've, you've probably noticed this when you go to a supermarket and there are 50 different kinds of toothpaste under the same brand under one shelf. But our buying behavior is changing and that has turned some of the old marketing truths upside down. A recent study by Bain found that CP, among CPG companies that they worked with, lowering the number of product offerings actually increased revenue by removing organizational complexity, focusing more energy and resources into product winners, and removing choice paralysis and confusion from shoppers, which is pretty much exactly what happens to me when I see 50 brands of toothpaste in the grocery store. And even though marketing strategy is shifting in physical retail stores, a big part of the shift is targeting consumers when they're online since more and more people are interacting on the web every single day. Digital ad sales are projected to be over $8 billion just from CPG alone in the US in 2019. How we interact and choose to buy things has completely changed as we've moved online. So instead of shopping as a tactile experience where we touch, smell, and examine the goods that we buy, people are now more accustomed to doing research. So instead of marketing appealing to sensory stimuli, people now instead have shifted their focus to things like ratings, comparison shopping, and how the products are actually used. So because consumer evaluation has changed, marketing also has to change. And it's not just about how we market, but who we market to. We'll talk a little bit about this in the next section, but the purchaser may not be the same end consumer anymore thanks to chatbots, concierge services, and home automation. So we'll have to understand who we should be marketing to and also what they care about. Right now, what people care about the most is a recommendation of a product from someone they know, and more and more people are finding different online resources as influential in their buying habits. So, things like online content, reviewers, and rating systems. And because of that, there's a huge content marketing push by many CPG brands who see online content not only as a good way to get in front of consumers closer to points of sale at their homes, but also because the sharing aspect of online content makes it a much lower customer acquisition cost, especially for smaller brands. And also, like I said before, people are more likely to trust things that their friends recommend. And a share is one type of endorsement. 
video content has also seen more online reviewers and personalities. So people like Michelle Fenn, who made a name for themselves by reviewing makeup and personal care products and showing how they're used, and she leveraged the trust that people have in her reviews to start her own cosmetic subscription box company, Ipsy. And that's why understanding these online influencer networks are really important. Platforms like Pinterest allow users to discover others who have similar tastes as them, and then they begin to trust the brands that their influencer networks suggest. And while Pinterest is one of the more popular platforms where influencers are created, there are lots of early stage companies working across a variety of platforms like Vine, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, which help connect brands with influencers that target demographics that they're interested in. We use CB Insights data to highlight some of the early stage companies in this space that have high mosaic scores, which is our algorithm for assessing company health. So I've been talking a bit about some of the changes that are happening when it comes to CBG marketing. Uh, but many of the underlying reasons that those shifts are occurring are because there's a growing role of e-commerce and in general product distribution is changing a lot and it will change more in the future. It's important to note that e-commerce is still a relatively small part of the market with just, 7%, just over 7% of total retail sales, but that number continues to grow. And that's especially the case in CPG, which has seen particularly more year-over-year e-commerce growth, above 40%, compared to overall e-commerce, which is just over 30%. And within CPG, laundry and detergent has seen the most e-commerce growth since last year, followed by toothpaste and snack bars. Running in parallel with the CPG's growing success in e-commerce platforms, the number of private e-commerce companies which distribute consumer packaged goods has increased significantly and they've raised more than $13 billion in 2015, particularly in non-US markets like China and India. But e-commerce is just one distribution point among many that CPG products will need to address in the future. I made this market map of different potential places where CPG products could be sold, and I populated it with companies by doing some keyword searches in our database. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about specific parts of this map. Um, I wanna take the next few slides to dive into a few companies and spaces, spaces that I think are particularly interesting, um, but that in the interest of time, I won't be able to go through everything. So like Victor said at the beginning, uh, these slides will be distributed later. Feel free to take a look through and reach out to me if you have any questions uh, about this market map. So to start, subscription e-commerce has become quite popular. With Birchbox leading the way with its $10 a month box that offers different samples of cosmetics and personal care products. The company did about $170 million in sales and about 50% of customers ended up buying a full size version of one of the samples in the box. The company has a focus on strong content marketing with millions of followers on their social media accounts who they actively engage with. And now the company's expanded to men's boxes and they have their own brick and mortar stores. Subscription boxes are interesting because they have a predictable revenue source. They also have predictable demand, which makes it easier to anticipate inventory needs. They skip retail networks entirely and go straight to consumers. And they have generally stickier customers since the boxes are typically in more niche interests and the customer doesn't need to decide every single time if they're going to be buying a good like they would in retail. Box companies like BarkBox, Umabox, and Foodsy all have publicly reported retention rates above 85%. And those reasons plus Birchbox's success have caused an uptick in activity in the subscription commerce space since 2011, though it has seen uh, some rocky recent quarters. Another more nascent field in the CPG distribution is home automation. So Jibo is a personal robot for the connected home that's in this space, and it's raised more than $55 million from institutional investors after a very successful Indiegogo campaign where it raised more than $3 million. So the reason that these home automation bots are important is because soon they'll become a point of sale for your goods in your home. You can already order an Uber through Amazon Alexa using voice, um, they actually recently announced that you can order fl flowers now too. But in the future, you might also say, Jibo, please order me more detergent. So how the brand is decided, the amount, etc., are still up in the air, but this is most likely gonna become an important area for CPG brands to keep a watch for. 
So in this case, would you have to negotiate with, say, Amazon or Jibo to negotiate the placement of your brand? Um, there are lots of questions that will have to be asked in the future. And the last distribution area we'll talk about are concierge services, which are virtual assistants or humans which do shopping on your behalf. Postmates is one of the bigger players in this category, having raised more than $137 million from some brand name investors, um, and apparently they're seeking $150 million more. These concierge services are important because they separate the buyer from the end consumer, and therefore, who's actually making the purchasing, deci purchasing decisions is different, and who you should be marketing to is different. Not only are you not actually viewing the products that you're buying, but how product decisions are made fall onto the person that's actually doing the shopping. So for example, I could give the grocery list to an outsourced assistant and allow them full leeway on the brands that they choose, or the shopper will ask me a list of clarification questions about what I want um, and what things I'm looking for in the products. So at that point, the product marketing and the brand perception actually falls into the hands of how the shopper is relaying information to me. This area has become particularly hot since Facebook recently announced chatbots and virtual assistants for businesses in their recent F8 conference. And other companies like Google have also launched their own grocery delivery service. But when it comes to public companies, Amazon is the most aggressive about positioning itself to control as many points in CPG distribution as possible. Currently, the company is not only investing in home automation, like I talked about before with the Alexa, uh, sorry, the Echo, but the company has already released dash buttons for instant reordering, on-demand delivery services, and the company is creating its own line of in-house products too. Right now, Amazon controls a small amount of grocery sales compared to some of the other more legacy retail players. However, grocery sales at those stores have slowed significantly, with some staying stagnant in their sales and others have actually seen negative growth. Um, actually, today, Fairway just filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Amazon already con significantly controls more than a fifth of the online food and beverage market, and it's positioned well to sell other goods as e-commerce becomes more prevalent, um, like we talked a little bit about before. And understanding Amazon's positioning for the future of e-commerce, many companies are taking advantage of the new avenues that the company is providing. So, for example, with the automatic dash buttons that we were talking about, um, some of the biggest companies in CPG are own a large portion of the total dash buttons that are sold. And that's because brands understand that there's a lot of value to be had from targeting consumers in their own homes. And that's why we'll wrap up the webinar by talking about benef the benefits of direct-to-consumer products and why more small companies are using this approach. One of the reasons direct-to-consumer has flourished is because not only do we have more data today to segment customers into relevant demographics for products, but there are more ways for them to frictionlessly buy products through their current behavior as they browse on web and mobile. Direct-to-consumer has several benefits. So for one, they have full control over their brand's perception and image, Plus, it's easier to push other products under the same brand, especially if the customer is buying directly from the product website. Direct-to-consumer also avoids the retail networks and relationships that smaller brands may not necessarily have, and reducing the number of points between the customer and the product also smoothens the supply chain as a whole. One of the, bin, one of the big benefits of interacting directly with consumers is that you can develop better relationships with your customers, and then you get feedback directly from them. And finally, just from a margins perspective, direct-to-consumer allows you to capture more value from your brand. This slide from a Charles River Ventures deck, which cites a Goldman graph, shows how removing the nodes from your distribution chain actually allows direct-to-consumer companies to capture more value from their brands. So some companies might use this to price down their products and undercut their competition, while others use it to capture more from their margins. And this development in direct-to-consumer has made the space more attractive for investors. So like Adam Rothenberg from Box Group says, the new distribution models are taking advantage of the inefficiencies in the grocery space. And that's why they want to invest in strong brands. So Box Group has made a few investments in CBG companies, including Lola, Aloha, and Harry's. And Box Group isn't the only VC invested in this space. 
When I looked at the number of VCs who made at least one CPG investment each year, we can see that since 2011, the number of unique VC investors into the space has gone up considerably, reaching a peak of 88 in 2014, though it did slow down in 2015. And Harry's is actually a great example of a company with VC investors that has built a strong new CPG brand by taking advantage of a lot of the shifts that I talked about in the webinar today. So I thought it would be a good mini case study to wrap up the webinar. The company started as a direct-to-consumer business and targeted a specific consumer in men who spend money on shaving products. And they did this with targeted marketing, like a campaign they did at the end of November, which they gave away their products and made special edition ones. They now still invest heavily in content marketing, including having their own men's lifestyle magazine. They utilize a subscription model, which has the benefits of recurring revenue and sticky customers, like I talked about before. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting about Harry's is that they actually bought the factory in Germany to produce their blades and became a more vertically integrated in their business and avoided dependencies on third parties. And finally, they focused on a limited number of products in their core competencies instead of inundating customers with a lot of line extensions. So all in all, Harry's is a great example of how a company is building its own new CPG brand by taking advantage of changing trends in the space. So thank you guys for taking the time to listen today, and hopefully you found this helpful. I'll take the rest of whatever time is left to answer some of the questions, but like Victor said, if I don't get to it right now, these questions are being recorded, and I'll try to answer as many of them as possible after the webinar as well, but you can reach out to me on Twitter or email me at, CB, at us, and Krishna at cbinsights.com. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the questions now. Um, are you seeing CPG companies investing in Internet of Things startups? Um, so like I sort of showed before with the business social graph, uh, CPG corporates are investing much more in direct brands or in distribution. So there's a lot less investment in uh, the Internet of Things space specifically, but you know you can take a look in our in our show of CPG investors uh, into IOT companies. Are these trends also happening in emerging markets? So the presentation was definitely more focused on trends that are happening in the US, though uh, there's definitely, uh, these trends definitely apply elsewhere too. CPG markets outside the US are so different and complex in their own way that um, we could have an entire webinar just dedicated to that. But that being said, some of the interesting trends I saw were how companies are appealing to a more mobile focused generation. So e commerce company is going mobile only and CPG brands having to adapt to a much smaller screen real estate. There's also an emerging middle class which spends more on food and groceries and how to target and segment those customers and solve their pain points. Um, there's also a whole issue of brand perception so and a lot of emerging markets people in upper class uh, buy Western products as a show status so brand perception and customer segmentation again is a huge focus. How can CPG corporates use new sets of data and what are some startups that are working on CPG data? Um, so some of the data sets that might be interesting to CPG corporates could be companies like Estimote or Swirl Networks, which analyze customer foot traffic and behavior in store. Um, I talked about some companies that use location data to better understand customer behavior. Um, but there are also companies like Second Measure, which um, recently came out of Y Combinator. It analyzes consumer purchases from credit card transactions. Um, we've also done a lot of research on, on real Internet of Things, which includes companies that are getting data from different points of the supply chain. So you can find that research on our blog. We've also done a webinar on that. Um, but those are just some of the data sources that will probably be interesting to CPG companies. Are new marketing solutions forcing CPG companies to spend more or less on advertising? Um, so in the, balance sheets, in the balance sheets that I looked at earlier in the presentation, um, the ad marketing expenditure was different per company. So some of them were increasing, some of them were staying stagnant. Um, P&G actually decreased their ad spend. I would say that at least for the near future, we're still transitioning between physical and the web. 
So companies are probably going to have to mount campaigns uh, both in the physical world and also the web, and that could increase expenditure in the short term. But in the long term, we might have more granular data on consumers, and we can better target them that way, So, especially at the points of sale. So that might be able to curb expenditure in the long run and make it more efficient. What are the impact of bots on CPG categories? Uh, bots seem to be the cool new thing in tech right now, but how bots actually play out is still sort of up in the air. Um, but one thing CPG companies should think about is how bots are going to interact with customers. So, for example, right now bots are entirely input based, so I have to tell bot uh, everything and the bot carries it out. But in the future, a bot might ping me, ask me if I need to restock on snacks. Um, so knowing what data is going into the bot to fuel its decision making and sort of what bot interactions look like are sort of definitely things to keep in mind for the future. Um, I'll take one more question. Are companies setting up CVC units as a means of generating returns for strategy and how are they assessing company performance? Um, I can't speak to any firm specifically, but in general it looks like CVCs in the CPG space are investing either as a means of distributing more of their product, better understanding their customers, or finding CPG brands that could be potential acquisitions in the future. How they choose to assess company performance most likely differ from comp differs from company to company, but uh, in most of the interviews that I've read, people who are starting these CVC funds at CBD corporates are more focused on being strategic investors to the company so that there's a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think it's probably more rare in this space to see someone um, invest money and then take a back seat. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about how corporations can respond to this and in general stay innovative, but unfortunately I have to wrap up now. Um, we have a lot of great research and webinars that are dedicated to corporate, uh, corporate innovation, so feel free to reach out to me and I'll make sure we get that relevant research to you. And it's also something that CB Insights as a company does to help out our clients. So uh, definitely reach out to me if those are questions that you have. Thanks again, guys, for um, checking out this webinar, and I hope it was useful. Take care. All right, thanks, Nikhil. And just as a final reminder, we will be reaching out to try to answer as many of the questions you asked as possible. So stay on the lookout for our email, um, and we'll also shoot out the slides and recording within 24 hours. So thanks again. Really appreciate your time and attention. Hope it was useful. And if you are looking at various types of data to inform your strategic decisions, you know we'd love to sort of show you the platform and how you can use our technology and our data to answer the questions on your own as well. Um, so thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.